Welcome. I'm John. I'm the event director at Literati Bookstore. We're pleased to welcome Nadia Ousu in support of Aftershocks and in conversation this evening with Donnie Walton. First, a quick over overview of webinars. You heard me as you came in, but as you're, if you're joining us late, the chat is closed, but you may want to keep the chat window open during the event as I will be dropping links to purchase Aftershocks from Literati Bookstore. And there's also a link to purchase books in the description below if you're watching us later on YouTube. If you're watching us live, you can submit questions for the Q&A at any time using the Q&A feature available to you at the bottom of your screen. Please don't hesitate to use the Q&A feature to submit your questions. Whenever you feel moved to do so, I'll read a selection at the conclusion of the conversation. And as a reminder, you can also shop for more books at literatibookstore.com for curbside pickup or to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. In lieu of a book purchase, we'd also ask that you consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming. So whether you'd like to think of that as this week's or this month's or this year's subscription to our programming, you can make donations at literatibookstore.com slash donation. Otherwise, we simply thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning or this afternoon, uh, depending on where and when in the world you may be joining us from. And so now I'd like to introduce our author and our moderator. Uh, Nadia Ousu is a Brooklyn-based writer and urban planner. She's a recipient of a 2019 Wedding Award. Her lyric essay, So Devilish a Fire, won the Atlas Review Chapbook Contest. Her writing has appeared or is forthcoming in the New York Times, the Washington Post's The Lily, Literary Review, Electric Literature, Epiphany, and Catapult. Aftershocks is her first book. And speaking her, with her this evening, Donnie Walton's the author of the novel, The Final Revival of Obel and Nev, forthcoming from 37 Inc. and Simon & Schuster. Her work as a fiction writer and a journalist explores identity, place, influence of pop culture. A McDowell Colony Fellow, a Tin House Scholar, and a graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop, she has worked as an executive level editor for magazine and multimedia brands, including Essence, Entertainment Weekly, Getty, and Life. A native of Jacksonville, Florida, she lives in Brooklyn as well. Um, they can't hear you, uh, but through the power of the internet, they can sense it. So please join me in welcoming Donnie Walton and Nadia Ousu into your living rooms. Well, Nadia, I'm going to applaud and cheer for you. We can't hear anyone, but I'm doing it right now. Thank you. Congratulations on this beautiful, powerful, incredibly moving and incredibly honest memoir, Aftershocks. I would love, I would love to hear you describe this book in your own words. Thanks, Donnie. Thanks so much for doing this with me and for your kind words. Um, so sure, I, I describe the book as a literary memoir uh, with threads of cultural history um, to explore themes like the complexities of family, the meaning of home, the multiplicity of identity, and the ripple effects, uh, both personal and generational, of trauma. Um, and just a little about my story. So my mother left when I was two and my sister and I were raised by our father, uh, who is the great hero of my life. And he worked for UN agency. So we moved to a different country every couple of years. And when I was seven and we were living in Rome after a long absence, my mother showed up at our house on the same day that I learned about a catastrophic earthquake that destroyed a city in Armenia. And I heard this on the radio because my father always listens to the BBC World Service in the morning. And um, I remember the voice on the radio talking about the possibility of aftershocks. And I asked my father what aftershocks are. And he said that they're the Earth's delayed reaction to stress. And then my mother showed up and, um, you know, we went for a walk, we went to lunch and maybe because my mother's Armenian American or because, you know, my father didn't really talk about her very much and I felt like I wasn't supposed to talk about her. Um, but the actual earthquake and sort of my private shaking and having her show up kind of combined in me and kind of led to me uh, being obsessed with earthquakes and sort of the ways we think about predicting and measuring disaster. And so that obsession kind of fermented and 
Um, you know, I lived through other disasters, both private and seismic, because of my father's job. We lived in Ethiopia during a civil war, in Uganda during a conflict there. I lived through 9 11 um, in New York. I was at the World Trade Center um, on that day um, and, you know, dealt with uh, panic attacks and depression and, you know, began to think of my life as existing on fault lines. Um, because um, of all of that, and then also just trying to figure out my sense of identity and who I was in the world. You know, I'm American um, because my mother was a U.S. citizen, but my father who raised me was Ghanaian. My mother, uh, my mother's family are Armenian. My stepmother is Tanzanian. And so it was always sort of this um, working to find steady ground, you know, even in my own sense of self. And so that's really what, what Aftershocks is about, is that sort of reckoning to, to try and figure out, you know, who am I in the world and how do I deal with um, these kind of um, earthquakes, both the private ones and sort of the disasters that I lived through. It is such a rich and just full book, full of memory um, of both very lovely moments, beautiful moments with your father, and also really painful, you know, traumatizing moments um, from your childhood. And I was really blown away. The beginning of the book has so much kind of visceral imagery and, and depth of emotion. And you refer a lot in the book to, you know, looking at old journals. Uh, going through all of those. And so I'm sort of curious about sort of the journey that you had from the journal to this beautiful memoir and, you know, how and when and why you decided to share your story with, with the world. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, you know, I, I started writing pieces of what ultimately became Aftershocks um, kind of as a private project. I was coming out of this period, this long period of really deep depression, and I had tried for a long time to sort of run from my grief over my mother leaving and my father dying when I was 13. But, you know, grief and trauma have a way of catching up with you. And I just had this strong sense that in order to truly find my way out to a healthier place, I needed to find deeper connection um, and deeper understanding of the histories that I carry in my DNA, including you know, the Armenian genocide, which actually brought my mother's family to America, the colonization of the African continent and Ghana, where my father came from um, the Ashanti tribe, uh, the wars and conflicts that I lived through as a child. And, um, you know, I didn't fully understand those forces, of course, as a child, because I was too young. And so as an adult, it, it began to feel really important to me to draw lines between those histories and how they're connected. And then also between those histories and my own body, and, you know, because I wouldn't have been born without those histories, I would have been a very different person without those histories. And, you know, I know that my birth was made possible because of those histories. And so I, I started writing the book to kind of reckon with all of that and make sense for it. And I was, I was doing a lot of research kind of just for myself. Um, and I kept journals, as you said, and notebooks, and particularly kind of documenting my experience of depression, but then also kind of documenting what I was learning about the places that my family came from. And then I sort of set all of that aside, and I thought I'd fictionalize some threads of it and write a novel, but I kept coming back to the raw material and, and finally sort of asked myself, if I could make art of that, because that kind of seemed to be what was most urgent. It felt like the story that was important for me to tell at that time and that maybe I wouldn't be able to write anything else until I wrote that story. And so I just kind of knew that there were other people carrying similar questions in their body. And I wanted to be part of, you know, that process of interrogating harmful narratives and writing ourselves to new possibilities and that maybe someone would pick up my book eventually, you know, once I had taken this raw material and turned it into a book, um, hopefully, and feel that they could maybe do the same thing, like create a story for themselves as well. It's so interesting what you said about, you know, this idea of you won't be able to write anything else until you get that out. That's what James Baldwin said about Go Tell It on the Mountain, which is a fictionalized version of his real life. Um, I think 
you know, a lot of authors, a lot of debut authors, you know, through whether it's fiction or straight memoir, it is very deeply personal and it also feels super vulnerable. So I just purely curious what it's been like to have your whole life in this book. It's out in the world. People are reading it. People feel, I mean, I feel like I know you a little bit, you know, what is that? It's an extra layer of vulnerability when, you know, sharing creative work with the world is already a vulnerable enough. So what is that process to like get to that extra level? Yeah. You know, so obviously I don't know how different it is from releasing a novel because I haven't done that. Um, but I am working on a novel now, so I guess I'll find out uh, if there's if there's a difference um, in terms of what it feels like. But, you know, I it there I, I guess what I'll say is that I'm feeling all of the emotions at once. You know, um, I do think that a memoir is deeply personal. It is a personal history and story. And at the same time, I have to remind myself that it's also not all of who I am. It is a narrative that I've constructed, you know, through an art making process. And also that the people in my life who are in the book, um, that doesn't capture, the book doesn't capture all of who they are either. But there is definitely, you know, as you, as you're saying something vulnerable about putting you know, pieces of myself and my truths out in the world for people to engage with and maybe even judge. And, you know, at the same time, I think often of um, an Audre Lorde quote, uh, when we're silent, we are, we are still afraid. So it is better to speak, remembering that we were never meant to survive. And I believe that so deeply, and particularly as a Black woman, um, you know, I had done all of this work, sort of this private project that I was doing for myself. I'd done all of this work to reckon with my history and my life and to do this bigger cultural and historical analysis and, you know, to, to put my perspective as a Black woman on the page. And so there was something about it that even though when I did realize maybe I want to turn this into a book and it did feel more vulnerable because I was thinking about, you know, who was going to be picking this up and reading it. At the same time, I was like, I'm not going to water this down. I did all of this work. Um, and I feel proud of myself for kind of speaking my truth and for, you know, really taking um, some narratives about, you know, the places that my family come from, about Africa, about my family, about my body and saying like, no, like I actually am going to tell a different story and I'm going to tell my version. And that felt so at the same time as it's vulnerable, it also felt really empowering. Mm hmm. It is probably one of the most honest books I've ever read, um, you know, about, you know, some of the, when you talk about being in boarding school and, and the parts with Agatha, I'm not going to give any spoilers, but, you know, those parts, I really was moved by, you know, how candid you were about the things that, you know, things that you're not very proud of, um, but things that I think all of us can relate to. I think that is the, the, the strength and the power of the book. But I want to talk about um, getting to that space of memory and asking a very kind of geeky writerly question because, you know, especially in these days of the pandemic and, you know, the political climate, it's very hard to get into a zone of writing. And um, so, you know, and a writer has to do that. But I think that, you know, I have extra respect for people who are writing memoirs because it does also require you to get into a space of memory. And so I'm very curious to know how you kind of got into that zone and how, you know, specifically what your writing sessions were like and how you got out of it when it was time to let it go. Yeah. So once I decided that I was going to write this book using the raw material that I started writing for myself, I knew that I wanted it to be a genre fluid book. You know, it's a memoir, but it's also intended to engage really deeply with history. And I wanted to move back and forth between my kind of more private griefs and struggles to these larger forces. And I wanted to show how history is always present in our day to day lives, you know, whether we notice it or not. And I think we're all kind of feeling that right now in many ways. Um, so many of the chapters in the book, as, as you were kind of 
speaking to, they start with a really vivid memory and then they open up into an exploration, you know, for example, of Pan-African philosophy or, you know, a memory about asking my father my, why my mother left when I was two opens up into an exploration of epigenetic inheritance um, and of my ancestors' trek through the Syrian desert and becoming American. Um, and And so I think that once I started examining those questions, so much cracked open and I found that really comforting in a way. And it also helped me to, you know, come to deeper understanding of the places and people that I belong to. Um, and in a way, I, I felt like I was writing myself into histories that I grew up with um, and, you know, but feeling just on the outside of because I grew up largely outside of my family's cultures. Um, and so in a way, like that kind of pushed me to keep writing into it because I was writing myself toward belonging. And once I kind of grasped that for myself, um, then it became really exciting. You know, like I felt like I had this opportunity to kind of write myself home and back into my own body. Mm -hmm. And there were times, you know, of course, when I felt like I'd pushed myself too hard to dig into my memories that were really difficult memories and into my grief. Um, but when I came to those moments, that's where sort of the structure of the book really supported me in many ways, because then I could put that aside for a moment and go do research about all the other issues that are in the book. Oh, um, you know, so I could take a break and I could go down a rabbit hole about, you know, HIV AIDS policy in Uganda in the 1990s, or I could read um, an article about John Coltrane and how he approached composing new music because I was pulling all of those threads into my own story. Um, I also took a lot of breaks to walk or meditate or, you know, I did dance breaks um, and moving my body, I think, was a big part of writing this book for me and kind of helped me to both go into my feelings, but then also to move through them and then shake them off at the end of the day. Um, and I'm really interested in exploring kind of the relationship between somatic practices, you know, like how we are in our bodies and movement and making art. And so that's something I'm kind of still experimenting with as well. Oh, I love that. You talked about um, just a, a minute ago about kind of pulling strength and inspiration from Audre Lorde. And I, you know, I really relate to calling on the elders, <laughs> um, the Black women. You see Tony behind me. Um, um, I'm curious, who else were you sort of calling on in your process of writing? Yeah, so I mean, I... Um... I come from, my father comes from the Ashanti tribe in Ghana, and I, I, uh, part of that Ghanaian tradition is, you know, ancestor worship, for lack of a better term, like Ghanaians and Ashanti people really believe that ancestors kind of shape and interfere in our lives. And, you know, we pour libation to our ancestors. And so in some ways, that was, that was part of what was um, making me write into this story was like, I was trying to um, connect with my ancestors in some ways by a better understanding their history and like looking at what existed in the Ashanti tribe pre-colonialism, for example, or exploring what it was like for Armenians to live in the Ottoman Empire and what it was like for like how they went through that period of, of genocide and sort of escape and what it was like to arrive in a new country in America where they didn't speak the language and, you know, be, have to start from scratch. And so I was really calling on my own ancestors, but then also sort of consulting at the same time with, you know, what I called this kitchen cabinet of mothers who are black writers that I have always turned to for much of my life, including Audre Lorde, including Toni Morrison, Toni Cade Bambara, um, Tsitsi Dangaremba, that I would sort of always pick up and read and find, you know, um, inspiration in a way to kind of keep dreaming about, you know, being a writer. Beautiful. Um, you tell the reader from the beginning of this novel, this is not a linear book. I'm going to take you all over. We're going to zip through time. And yet I felt like I was never lost in it. I felt there was always sort of um, very masterful control that you had over the story. And so I, when I was reading, I was thinking, I have to ask her, did, did Nadia have an organizing principle in mind? 
Yeah, I mean, obviously, definitely, first of all, thanks so much. That means so much to me um, that, that, you know, you connected with the structure. Um, and it took me a really long time to get there. I think at first, because this started as a private project, I wasn't too worried about anyone else reading it. And so I was really kind of writing into my own curiosities and wherever my curiosities took me. And then when I realized that I was that I was going to try and turn this into a book, then I began to really think about, okay, what anchors does that, I knew that I didn't want it to be a linear story, um, but I started asking myself, like, what anchors does the reader need in order to continue reading on um, and you know earthquakes have as I said always been sort of a guiding metaphor in my life um, even though I didn't always notice it but um, once I realized um, and it actually took someone else pointing it out to me that oh you write about earthquakes a lot or seismic terms show up a lot um, in in the writing and this was one of my early readers who was you know giving me that feedback and once she told me that you know, it did sort of um, kind of ring a bell in my head. And I realized that the story of an earthquake is not linear, you know, it's not easily understood except in retrospect. And that's how I kind of felt about the story of my life. You know, sometimes it turns out that what we thought was the earthquake was actually a foreshock. Um, and the story has to kind of be reshuffled. And, you know, the thing about aftershocks is that we don't really know when they're going to happen or how long they'll last. And I think that's also true of how we experience trauma. And so the book is written thematically um, with the stages of an earthquake and seismic terms kind of linking the threads. Um, and this was also this kind of made sense to me too, I think, because in African cultures, um, many African cultures, time is not a straight line. It's circular and there are circles within circles and we move in and out of them. And, you know, as I said, um, with the Ashanti tribe, the past and present coexist, you know, the ancestors are among us and that's how I kind of experienced the world and time. Um, but I did want to provide, you know, some anchors and posts for readers to hold on to. So in addition to the principle of kind of starting from a memory and then panning out, and hopefully that the memory will be what guides the reader through kind of these broader explorations, um, I was also influenced by sort of Black American storytelling traditions too, um, and particularly listening to um, or reading about how Toni Morrison thought about her own writing and um, sort of the, the fact that, you know, she was writing for the story to be um, to be heard out loud as well as read and thinking about how the Ashanti tribe has a really ancient oral storytelling tradition. And so in some of the chapters, I also wanted to try and evoke, you know, the essence of call and response through the rhythm of the language and the use of refrains and repetition, which I also kind of saw as anchors that might carry the reader through the book as well. Yeah, I think I think it becomes like, it sort of builds toward the end and you have those beautiful passages, beautiful rhythms at the end. Um, you also have the sort of anchor, the, the through line of the blue chair. Can you talk about the blue chair a little? Yeah, so, um, so the blue chair, uh, when I was in this period of sort of deep depression, I um, was kind of wandering around New York City and, um, just trying to keep moving because I felt like if I stopped moving then I wouldn't be able to continue on in my life and I saw this blue chair by the side of the road and it kind of called to me and I felt like I needed this chair and so I dragged it into my um, into my apartment and put it in my room and um, and what ended up happening was that that blue chair kind of became a whole world that I retreated to for about seven days during this period of depression when I really felt like I needed to sort through these feelings of grief and longing and loss and displacement that I had and make meaning of my own identity. And I ended up doing that in this blue chair. And so the blue chair sections, which are like sections that show up consistently in the book, um, in addition to kind of the earthquake metaphor, um, sort of tell the story of the seven days that I spent in my room. Um, and what I was trying to do in those sections um, is to kind of write into what my mental health crisis felt like in my body and to really write it from the place of 
um, what it felt like in, in the moment, like what was going on in my heart and mind and body as I was experiencing that. Um, and so that's sort of um, the blue chair sections, which then help me to, they serve as sort of a trampoline to then reflect on these memories and on this broader cultural history and reckoning as well. Um, I, so I, I found the blue chair passages to be, you know, so um, beautifully vulnerable and um, just a, a, you know, a very helpful metaphor to kind of explain um, what you were going through. But I want to talk about your dad because I loved the parts with your dad. There are so many wonderful, warm stories with him. Um, without saying what this is, I love the the one in the church at the christening and the baby. <laughs> I'll leave that as a tease for you all to um, read. But I would love to know, you know, what is what is one thing that you would want your readers to take away about your dad, who you call the hero of your life? Yeah, so, you know, my love for my father was so deep, and I know that his love for me was as well, and the knowledge of that love has kind of carried me through difficult times and given me strength and hope and belief that, you know, even when I'm lonely, that love exists in the world and can exist again for me, like even when I'm going through loss. So it felt really important to honor that and to write him in such a way that readers could could get a glimpse of who he was and learn from him in the way that I did. And, you know, he taught me so much and so much of my worldview and so many of my dreams are built on his worldview and dreams. You know, he worked um, in kind of emergency food aid um, going into disasters. Um, and um, he talked to me a lot about injustice and, you know, how we have to make choices every day to undo it and how we all have that in us. And, he talked to me a lot about Pan-Africanism and collectivism and connection and sort of pushed me to ask questions about the world and of myself. And, you know, he was also my first editor. I used to write these little novels um, and I would sort of lie on, on my stomach on the floor of his home office and, you know, write these little novels and illustrate them and then give them to him for feedback. Um, and he was also a poet. And so he would kind of share his poetry with me as well. Um, but it also felt really important for me to write about my relationship with my father because the story we're often told about, you know, what family is um, holds that families like mine are broken, you know, because my mother left when I was so young. And, you know, we're told that nuclear families are the only kinds of families that we should think of as whole. But in writing this, I was reclaiming, you know, the story of my family. And I kept coming back to that love that my father had for me and my sister and how that love was whole. And that, you know, even though my mother wasn't around, that my father did mother me. And that also because of, um, his upbringing and the Ashanti tribe being like a really collectivist um, society that I also had all of these aunties and my grandmother who were really there for me in really meaningful and deep ways as well. And so I did have mothering. And so I was sort of reminding myself of that because I think I had also internalized those dominant stories, um, you know, whether that's about single mothered families or single fa fathered families in my case, or, you know, queer families. But, you know, those stories, um, I was realizing how, how much they're baked into policies that impact people's lives. And so it felt really Really important to me to interrogate them and undo them including undoing them in myself and then also just to celebrate you know the love that that existed for me through my father and his family as well and what you write about your what you call your two mothers is a little trickier uh your mother your birth mother and your stepmother annabelle with whom you had a somewhat fraught relationship after your your father passed away um, I think, you know, one thing for the paperback edition, I'm sure a lot of people would love an afterword to this book and to sort of understand, you know, where things stand now, especially with this book out, um, how your mother, if your mother and Annabelle have read the book and, and what response they've gotten and how your relationship um, has been. Yeah, so, you know, I... 
I did allow myself to be really honest and to tell the truth. And, you know, I, I also do have an author's note in the beginning of the book that I can only write my version of the story, but that doesn't mean that I don't believe other people's. And, you know, I'm not talking about differences in facts, you know, there are the facts of what happened. And we sort of live in a world now where, you know, facts have been up for debate in really harmful ways. So I'm not talking about that. But then there is our relationship to what happened and our emotions about what happened and our motivations and, you know, the extent to which we had access to what other people were going through, or what was in their hearts and the extent to which we were willing to understand or try to understand what was going on um, for other people. And so I wanted to also be honest about my part in the dynamics with my mother and my stepmother and I tried to hold on to the a principle you know that I have mentioned before that I was trying to write toward love and connection and that required me to not make anyone a villain in my story um, and to try and extend compassion and to work to make you know everyone who I was um, telling stories about as multi-dimensional as possible and to try and kind of show the fullness of their humanity and not sort of narrow them down to a single story. So I did my best to do that. Um, and, and, you know, I, I also realized that, um, you know, once it was no longer going to be a private project and I was going to put it out into the world, um, that it was also really important for me to sort of open up conversations with them you know they had both read pieces of the book before they were published um and i felt like that was important to me um but it 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 still did it was still was my story and i needed to sort of speak my truth um the writing of the private project i will say is what ultimately that ultimately became aftershocks actually pushed me to reach out to my mother um after you know our decade long estrangement um you know after my father died i i called my mother to see you know if she would come for my sister and me and she sort of said that she still wasn't ready to be um, our mother. And so I told her I was, was never going to speak to her again. And I, so I kept that promise for, for 10 years. Um, in the meantime, my stepmother with whom I had a very, um, complicated, sometimes tense, um, relationship did sort of step up and invite my sister and I to continue living with her. And, you know, despite sort of the complicated relationship and the ways in which we feuded and struggled with each other, um, over the years, um, it felt important to me to also honor that fact that she, you know, she was there for me in, in, in many ways. Um, and so, you know, I was trying to sort of write toward repair, write towards sort of self-knowledge and awareness of my own role um, in, in some of the, the, the kind of tensions um, in my life. Um, with my mother, you know, we're in my birth mother, we're in, um, in a process, you know, it's a daily process of trying to reconcile and build a relationship that we didn't have when I was a child. And, you know, actually, she's been really supportive of me writing this book. And in fact, has been sort of, she read it in a day, and then she's sort of been driving around New England, taking photos of it in bookstores, um, which has been really sweet. And, you know, I'm very grateful for that. Um, my stepmother and I have a complicated relationship. You know, one of the catalysts for that sent me into this blue chair and into this reckoning was that my stepmother, uh, during a fight, revealed um, or or a secret or a lie about my father that caused me to sort of question everything and like felt really sort of like damaging to my sense of self. And that has been really hard for me to work through. And um, at the same time, you know, we do have this history, um, and she's my brother's mother, um, and, you know, he's one of the most important people to me. So, you know, we are in each in, in each other's lives. Um, it's challenging. There's hurt. Um, but I, I do have hope, and, you know, I'll, I'll sort of leave it at that. Yeah, I hope so too. I hope so too. I, I, I do. I, I love this um, image of your mother taking photos of the book. <laughs> In the stores, I think that's so lovely, and I I think she's probably very proud of you. Yeah. Um, the idea of home and searching for home 
is a huge theme in the book. And I was thinking, you know, we're both at home right now. We're probably <laughs> like less than a mile from each other. We're in the same neighborhood of Brooklyn. And, you know, Nadia and I were joking before we got on that, you know, the first time that I had been on a Zoom event was an event Nadia was taking place, was, was um, participating in. Um, at the top of, of the pandemic. And we surely thought we would be out by now. Um, but I just wanted to ask how, you know, the pandemic has changed at all your sort of definition of home and how you've made your home as you, as comfortable um, as you can, you know, now that we, there's no traveling anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. You know, I think um, for much of my life, I sort of longed to belong. We moved so much. And, you know, just as we were settling into a country and learning the language and making friends, we had to leave it. And so there were all there were so many times when I was like, can't we just stay in one place? You know, um, since writing the book and over the years, I've come to define home and family kind of really expansively and, and to claim all of the places and peoples that I've lived among and loved and tried to belong to in many ways um, through my love for them. But it, it did take me a long time to get there. And I think during the pandemic, I've thought a lot about how a place becomes home because you persist in loving it um, and in caring for your neighbors and your community and the, the people in your life. And so it has been even more important for me, for me, especially because we are so sort of distanced and I don't see a lot of people um, in person. Um, so I've been thinking about how do I continue to make this place my home by connecting to my neighbors and community, whether that's sort of participating in kind of mutual aid efforts, um, where, you know, neighbors sort of deliver groceries and, and uh, support elders in ways that we can, um, saying hello to my neighbors sort of from a distance and asking them how they're doing um, with our masks on. Um, and then also just being really intentional about, you know, my sister also lives in Brooklyn in another neighborhood, but continuing to be really intentional about, about making sure that I'm seeing her and, and connecting with her. Um, and then also, you know, with my dear friends and family who are not here, who live in the UK or in Ghana and other places and connecting with them across distance because they're my home too. And so I guess I, I, what I've come to is that home is both place or places, but it can also be people. And so homemaking for me is really about, you know, it's an active thing and it's about growing community and nurturing community. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing I've been doing in pandemic is buying a lot of books <laughs> and, you know, there's nothing like having a brand new one, um, especially when they have such beautiful covers. I would love to talk to you about your cover, um, about the artist and any little details you want to give about the evolution of the cover and, and what it sort of symbolizes for you. Yeah, so I I really love the cover and it was sort of like a process to get to this cover, you know, um, Alison Forner, who is an art director at Simon & Schuster designed it. And what I really loved about this one, you know, there were multiple kind of covers before, but then with this cover, it was so striking. There was so much kind of rich, evocative detail. I really loved the the kente like cloth um, that the figure is wearing. And it's the, the the same kind of cloth is kind of patterned into her hair, which yeah. you know speaks to my Ghanaian heritage. Um, I also think the way the one shoulder is bared is really bold and also kind of vulnerable. And going back to what we were talking about earlier about the vulnerability of, you know, releasing a book like this, but then also feeling sort of that it's something bold and powerful at the same time. Um, and then also I like that she, you know, the, the figure on the cover is sort of walking away, but also probably towards something, which I think is so much a part of the book. And, you know, also my mother's back is an image that recurs um, in the book as well. Right. Um, yeah, and then just the colors, you know, they're so vibrant, the red and the yellow and connecting to the urgency and the earthquake theme. Um, yeah, so I, I kind of feel like I'm spoiled because this is my first book and I really love the cover so much. It's beautiful. And now that you say it, I do feel like her stance has purpose. Yeah. Even though you can't see her face, I get that feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Did anything surprise 
surprise you in the process of writing in your research or in what you remembered? Yeah, I mean, I think definitely sort of once I started kind of reflecting on memories, little details that bubbled up surprised me. Um, I also found it really surprising. You know, I have a background um, as well as studying creative writing. I have a background in urban planning and policy. Um, kind of focused largely on issues of racial justice. And I was surprised by how much I engaged, you know, my studies um, on, on those issues and work on that front to kind of hone the questions that I was asking in the book. When I think about cities, you know, as a, as a urban planner and policist, I'm asking people, I'm asking how people kind of interact with each other um, and with place. And I'm also asking sort of who places serve and why. Um, and what allows people to feel a sense of security and of belonging. And, you know, I also think in my policy and planning work, a principle that I hold is that it's really important to reckon with and learn from history. And uh, what ideologies and philosophies are baked into the systems that exist now and into how sort of the built environment is constructed. And, you know, what do we need to undo in order to make those systems and structure structures and, you know, um, public spaces more inclusive. And, you know, so I was thinking a lot about that in the work that I was doing. And then that helped me to also think about, okay, what do I need to understand about my own history? What do I have to reckon with in my own history? Um, and so that was that was an interesting kind of interplay between kind of my day job and sort of my creative life. I'm glad you talked about that because when I read your bio, I was like, wow, how do those things go together? <laughs> no, that's really cool. Yeah, the well, same thing about time to kick it over to the audience for more questions. But Nadia, congratulations on this beautiful book. Um, I'm so excited for everyone to read it and to um, take so much nourishment from, from your story. Thank you so much, Donnie. This has been a lovely conversation. Yay. <laughs> Thank you both uh, for this, for a truly wonderful conversation. We do have a couple questions from the audience and I'll remind folks that they still, if they would like to submit their questions, there's time to do so. We have time for a few questions. So if, you, if you've if you got a question for, for Nadia or for Donnie, uh, please uh, uh, feel free to submit it in. Um, the first question for Nadia, um, Nadia, did you keep journals when you were a young girl? Did you always know you'd be a writer? Yeah, I mean, I as long as I can remember, I did dream of being a writer. Like, I I really wanted um, to write um, to write books. In fact, um, and so that was an aspiration that I've had my whole life, um, as as far as I can remember. Um, and I did keep um, sort of a diary for much of my young life. I'm sort of writing observations, what I saw. I also wrote like little stories and little novels, you know, and um, always sort of reflecting on what I was seeing in the world around me, what was happening in my family and how I felt. And so it, it became sort of a practice and is a big part of how I even understand what I think and feel um, is through writing. So yeah, there's a been a big part of my life. There's a question for Donnie. As a former former journalist, you used to write nonfiction, and you're about to publish a novel. What advice would you give to Nadia as she shifts <laughs> from nonfiction to fiction? That's a great question. Oh, you know, <laughs> I actually um, it is a great question. Um, my nonfiction background really informed the novel um, that I wrote, um, it's which is structured as an oral history, which is a nonfiction form um, in which you, you know, a sort of invisible curator is weaving together, you know, um, stories from different people uh, to tell a larger, a larger story. Um, I think that having a, sense of what rings true uh, is super important to lean into. Um, I think that, you know, if you've interviewed people, I think that you, you know, it helps to get a feel for how people speak and what they say 
um, versus what they don't say, you know, finding sort of the truth in the silence as well is, is, is a good thing. Um, I think, oh gosh, I think the two forms really like, I'm excited about your novel, you know, and I think that your experience in nonfiction will only aid it. You know, I think that sometimes it's more difficult to play because you are sort of worried about things feeling so true that in that early drafting period, it can be a little bit difficult. That's something that I struggle with. So as much as you can, like whatever you do to play, you know, try to get into that space to be a little that. bit looser and a little bit more experimental. I love that. Thank you. And the memoir question. The memoir takes on sort of novelistic forms, I guess, or can be structured that way. So I wonder if get, get down your answer has me thinking about how you can sort of kind of just switch tracks a little bit to get into the, the oh, novel really? writing phase. And then you're sort of, you, yeah, you're sort you can open some, some imaginative aspects to the process. Yeah. And it sounds um, like Nadia earlier in the process, you were thinking of making your memoir sort of a fictionalized account, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that it's those things that you were pulling from your own life, probably that gave whatever drafts you were working on that veracity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and with this one too, I definitely am pulling from, you know, from my life and following my curiosities and questions that I'm holding right now into it as well. And someone writes in wanting to know if if it's not if it's too early for you to talk about your experiences, your novel writing experience versus you know this memoir writing experience. Yeah, I mean, it, it, what Donnie was saying kind of rings true. Like in some ways, I I the reason that I really wanted to write a novel next was I was sort of like I want to write something completely different. I've sort of been in my own like world and life and for for so many years now with this book, and I just want to kind of leap out into different, you know, questions and also to, to play and, and try something completely new. And then what, what I found when I first started to try and write it, um, was that it, I actually felt more constrained in some ways, um, for the reason that Donnie was talking about, which was like, does it, does this seem real? Like, am I going too far with the invention? You know, and that was like a muscle that I had to, sort of I'm continuing to try and sort of figure out um, how to flex. Um, and then another thing I'll say is that uh, it's so with with this book, I was able to, as I said, kind of like go off on these tangents and do this like a lot of research and sort of pull that into the book. Um, and mm -hmm. that's something that I really love to do. But in kind of early drafts of this, and I think some of that will be in the novel, and it is very concerned with like real issues and themes and questions that I'm wrestling with. But of course, like it has to be led by the characters in the story. And so I'm I'm trying to find a balance um, so that the the narrative doesn't get bogged down with all of this research that I really love doing. So that is something that I'm trying to figure out now as well. Thank you. Yeah, the research is can, it can definitely bog you down. You have to like understand what you can take and what you can leave. Leave, yeah. Um, I think we have time for one more question, so I'll, I'll just squeeze in a classic uh, bookseller question if you'll humor me um and we always like to ask authors what they in addition to each other's books and of course you can uh <laughs> purchase nadia's book from literati bookstore you can pre-order donnie's book from literati bookstore as well but we're always curious to know what you're reading and enjoying um of course i'm happy to expand it as well i know that i have a, a pile of books on my bedside table that's sort of just collecting dust um, so if we want to open it up to also maybe what you're w watching or listening to and enjoying as well, um, we're happy to source any and all recommendations for our viewers. Yeah, I mean, I can start. So I just received um, a galley of Donnie's books. I'm very excited oh. about that. <laughs> Thank you. So that, that is definitely on my list. And then um, what I'm currently reading is a book called Detransition mm -hmm. Baby that I'm super into and really excited about right now. 
and um, also another um, book that I'm um, that is in this uh, this other pile, which is in my room, um, is Milk Blood Heat by Don Teal Moniz. Which so mine. Story <laughs> and it's amazing. So it is that's another one. <laughs> yeah, Don Teal Moniz is actually from my hometown. Oh so wow! I felt like a connection to her um, from Florida. All her book is full of. Florida stories. Uh, it's a really beautiful mm. book. Um, I just got in the mail today a memoir, Surviving the White Gaze by Rebecca Carroll, which I'm very excited to read. I hear great things about that. Um, and I'm excited about, there's a novel coming out in the summer called Revival Season by Monica West. Mm. I am just about to crack that open. It's on my night table. Nice. Wonderful. Well, thank you for those recommendations. Um, folks can look out for those uh, books that are forthcoming uh, at our store and purchase the ones that are out. Deep Transition Baby is available at Literati as well. Um, Nadia and Donnie, thank you so much for joining us tonight at Home with Literati. It was such a pleasure to have both of you. Nadia, congrats on the publication of this book um, and all its success. And, and, and Donnie, we hope to have you back uh for the final revival of opal and nev very soon um but thank you both for joining us we both um hope you continue to stay safe and be well and hope to have you in the store sometime in the future as well when when it is safe to do so and to all of our attendees thank you of course as always for joining us this evening and we hope you stay safe and be well as well and we look forward to seeing you at the next event so good night everybody take care good night thank you so much bye all bye